You know, if you really want to find out what's really important to a person, all you have to do is sit down with them for a few minutes and just hear them talk. Just hear them talk, right? And eventually, uh, the things that are really important to them will start to make their way out um, in your conversation with them. So as I have conversations with some of you, I find out things that are important to you and the things that you gravitate towards and the things you begin to talk about. And same with me. The things that I talk about are important to me. And if you were to sit down and have a conversation with the Scripture, and just have a talk with the Scripture, and just have a conversation with the Word of God, and allow the Scripture to talk, it'd be interesting to find what would come out of the Scripture. And as we've been talking about, I would say to you that in the midst of your conversation with the Scripture, probably one-third of what the Scripture is saying would be, would be based on prophecy, would be based on end times. It's interesting, as you look at the Word of God, much of the books of Daniel and Isaiah are prophetic. The minor prophets, prophetic. One of the final major teaching moments in Jesus' teaching ministry was all about prophecy. Some of the final recorded questions from the disciples related to prophecy. Paul wrote about the things to come and frequently mentioned end times events. And, as many of you are well aware, the last book of the Bible is all about prophecy. So the Bible treats the end times as important. The Bible talks about prophecy being important. Prophecy sometimes um, can get uh, stereotyped to kind of um, the wacky people of the world. And that is probably an unfair stereotype. Um, because even though some people have taken certain end times views and have extrapolated it for their own benefit or have made it purposeful for their own means, that's unfortunate. Um, but that shouldn't keep us from studying what the Word of God says and to be true to the Scripture and allow the Scripture to speak for itself. The Bible does not state... Oh, I'm going to step on some toes here. Even on July 4th weekend. The Bible does not state that America is the answer to the world's problems. The Bible doesn't state that. The Bible doesn't state that the American president is going to ride on a white horse coming from the heavens. It doesn't state that. Now, some people might think that. The Scripture states very clearly that this mess that we have made of this world is going to be solved by Christ. It's going to be solved by Christ. And we, in and of ourselves, are not the solution to our problems that we have here on the planet. Christ is. And in a very real, dramatic way, Christ will one day come back and begin to set things straight. Well, Paul talked a lot about the end times when he was ministering in different churches, and particularly as he was ministering to the Thessalonians. So I'm going to ask you to please stand for the reading of God's Word as we look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. You're welcome to read along with me in your passage of the Scripture as I read this out loud. 1 Thessalonians 5, and we'll look at verses 1 through 11. Now concerning the times and the seasons, brothers... You have no need to have anything written to you, for you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying, there is peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman and they will not escape. But you are not in darkness, brothers. For that day to surprise you is a thief. For you are all children of light, children of the day. We are not of the night nor of the darkness. So then let us not sleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night. And those who get drunk are drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet the hope of salvation. For God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we are awake or asleep, we might live with him. 
Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up just as you are doing. Thanks, you can be seated. That is the word of God from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. Go back and look with me again at verse 2. Verse 2, 1 Thessalonians 5, 2. For you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. The day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. Thessalonians, you're fully aware of this. How are the Thessalonians fully aware of this? Because Paul, in a previous visit, had already shared with the Thessalonians much of what about he's about to share with them again. And he'll re- reiterate that same concept in 2 Thessalonians, that they wouldn't be rattled by a word from another apostle or be rattled by a word in saying that the day of the Lord had already come. And that's happened a lot in the last century, hasn't it? Or people have said it's, it's, it's here or it's this date or it's coming at this time. And Paul specifically says to these Thessalonians, don't live that way. The day of the Lord can only happen when certain things happen first. And those things have to transpire before the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord is a prophetic event in God's timetable where his wrath is poured out on mankind. All right, so if you're taking notes, that's a pretty decent definition of the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord is a prophetic event in God's timetable where his wrath is poured out on mankind. The day of the Lord could be thought of not necessarily specifically having to be locked into a 24-hour period, meaning this is the 24-hour period of the Lord. Don't necessarily think of it like that. Think of it more as the era um, or the age of the Lord. The day of the Lord could be thought of as the era of the Lord, the age of the Lord, because as we'll see in our scripture this morning, the day of the Lord is a time period that starts with a particular sequence of events and ends with a particular event, the day of the Lord. So this is where God is pouring out his wrath on mankind in a very noticeable way. The day of the Lord, different than what we talked about last week. Last week we talked about the rapture of the church how there's coming an event where the church is going to be ushered off of the planet in the twinkling of an eye, uh, along with the dead in Christ, um, to meet the Lord in the air. That's the rapture of the church, the catching up of the church. That was a mystery. That was something that wasn't previously revealed in the Old Testament. The day of the Lord is not so. The day of the Lord was well known. The day of the Lord was not a mystery. The day of the Lord was frequently discussed in the Old Testament, and the theme carries right into the New Testament. The day of the Lord appears 19 times in the Old Testament, and depending on uh, what translations you're reading, between four and five times in the New Testament, meaning this is well attested to. And the Old Testament frequently talked about it, as did the New Testament. Whenever the day of the Lord is discussed, it's always the same thing. It speaks to God's powerful and noticeable intervention in the matters of mankind. When the Old Testament writers were writing about the day of the Lord, oftentimes they were talking about um, near events that were happening kind of right in front of them. So circumstances that were happening right in their immediate future but also, sometimes in the very next phrase, they would look down the corridors of time and talk about events relating to the day of the Lord which were still to come. So when the, New Te- when the Old Testament writers are talking about the day of the Lord, oftentimes it has to do with something that's right about to happen and something that's going to happen down the road. And that's really how the day of the Lord is laid out in the Old Testament. For example, the prophet Joel spoke of the day of the Lord and saw the Assyrians near future coming. That's chapters one and two of the book of Joel. But in chapter three, he speaks of the nations and the future of Judah. 
That's a good example how Joel was talking about things that were about to happen, but also things that were going to happen later. Good example of how the Old Testament handles the day of the Lord. Another example would be Obadiah. Obadiah's first 14 verses spoke of the destruction of Edom, but then from verse 15 on communicates the final judgments of all the nations. You know, anytime you're studying the Bible and you're studying a phrase in the Bible or a word in the Bible, a good thing to do when you're studying a particular word or phrase is to go back and look at the first reference to that word or phrase. The first place that we see the day of the Lord mentioned is found in Isaiah chapter 13, verses 6 through 11. This is the first place in the Bible that the day of the Lord is mentioned. It says this, Wail, the day of the Lord is near. As destruction from the Almighty, it will come. Therefore, all hands will be feeble. Every human heart will melt. They will be dismayed. Pangs and agony will seize them. They will be in anguish like a woman in labor. Interesting, we just read that from the Apostle Paul in 1 Thessalonians 5. They'll look aghast at one another. Their faces will be aflame. Behold, the day of the Lord comes cruel with wrath and fierce anger to make the land a desolation and to destroy its sinners from it. For the stars of the heavens and their constellations will not give their light. The sun will be dark at its rising and the moon will not shed its light. I will punish the world for its evil and the wicked for their iniquity. I will put an end to the pomp of the arrogant and I will lay low the pompous pride of the ruthless. Interesting. Versus uh, Isaiah chapter 13. Context of this passage has to do with the Babylonians. Near. But also there's some end times, so there's some world elements that Isaiah talks about here that definitely would point to a future time. Events that would be earth-shaking and global in impact good example of how the day of the Lord is handled. The day of the Lord is also portrayed as a day of darkness and an, out, an all-out outpouring of God's wrath of sinners. The darkness element could be found in Amos 5, 18 through 20. You can see that on the screen. Woe to you who desire the day of the Lord. Why would you have the day of the Lord? It is darkness, not light, as if a man fled from a lion and a bear met him. Or went into the house and leaned his hand up against the wall, and a serpent bit him. Is not the day of the Lord darkness, and not light, gloom, with no brightness in it at all? Not a pretty picture. Not something you'd want to read on a birthday card, right? This is the day of the Lord. It's presented as being darkness, difficult, deadly this day of the Lord now the New Testament not to be confused the New Testament speaks of the day of Christ this is not the same event as the day of the Lord sometimes you'll read in Paul's writings the day of Christ the day of Christ should be interpreted as the judgment seat of Christ the Bema seat the evaluation seat of the Lord um There is no wrath or there is no worry or there is no fear for the believer that is in Christ. Why is that? Because on the cross, Jesus absorbed all of God's wrath on him. He took all your punishment on him. And Romans 8.1 says, because of that, there's no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. There's no condemnation. That doesn't mean that in moments of sin or we're having trouble in sin that there isn't a lack of fellowship that needs to be restored between us and God but no condemnation. That was taken care of on the cross. That is awesome. That is really good. So you can know that even when you're struggling with sin, there's no condemnation from God. There's no condemnation. We are not sent back to hell or our salvation is undone. That can't happen because we're sealed in the Holy Spirit. The day of Christ is an opportunity for God, the Lord Jesus, to give to us blessing and honor and to give us rewards and to say job well done. Job well done. It's not the same as the day of the Lord. Those events should not be confused with each other. If you want to read more about the judgment seat of Christ, the day of Christ, you could read 2 Corinthians chapter 5. For many teachers of the Bible, the day of the Lord begins with the judgments 
that you see in Revelation chapter 6 and end with the return of Christ in Revelation 19. The judgments of the tribulation period and the day of the Lord are mentioned really all throughout the Bible. Let's talk about the timing of the day of the Lord. So that's a bit of a background on the day of the Lord. Lots of things to study there. Um, Hopefully you can dig in a little deeper on your own time and do some more study on the day of the Lord. But the timing of the day of the Lord, boy, we as humans, we love to figure things out, don't we? We love to figure things out. It's like when my wife is beginning to plan um, a surprise party for me. Boy, I can just sniff that out almost immediately. Except for my most recent graduation party, she did really well in that, and I, I did not figure that out. But every other party, you could see the signs that were coming. You know, secret phone calls and birthday cakes sitting on the counter. Is this, what, what, what is that? And we, we try to figure these things out. Well, I wonder when that's gonna happen. Well, why do you need to know what's gonna happen? Well, I just need to know. Well, do you need to know? Well, yeah, I just need to know. And as humans, we're always in this state of, well, I just need to know. Well, I gotta know when that's happening, and I gotta know when this this event is happening, and I gotta know when, when, if Jesus said this, I gotta know exactly when that's gonna happen. And it's almost like Jesus would say, just relax and be prepared. And we'll see that in just a moment. We'll see that in just a moment. The Bible does not tell us when the events of the day of the Lord are going to happen, nor the return of Christ. The the Bible does tell us with some specificity the length of time and also the chronology, but it never says on this day or at this exact moment, it doesn't say that. However, the Bible does give some really interesting prophecy relating to the things that are to come. Some really interesting prophecy. And if you have your Bibles, I'd like you to turn with me to the book of Daniel. or your e-Bible, the book of Daniel. Daniel chapter nine. Daniel, at this point of the book of Daniel, he is living in Babylon, he is deported to Babylon, he is living in captivity in Babylon, and Daniel is praying relating to the future of Israel. This is a very important passage of scripture. In fact, Other than the prophecies relating to Christ, this um, passage of scripture is so remarkable in its detail and the specificity by which Daniel details these things. Daniel chapter nine, verse 24. It says this, Daniel, actually we'll start in verse 20. While I was speaking and praying, confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel and presenting my plea before the Lord my God for the holy hill of my God, praying about the future of Jerusalem. While I was speaking in prayer, the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at first, came to me in swift flight at the time of the evening sacrifice. He made me understand, speaking with me, saying, Daniel, I have, num- I have now come out to give you insight and understanding. At the beginning of your pleas for mercy, a word went out, and I have come to tell you, for you are greatly loved. Therefore, consider the word and understand the vision. Verse 24. Seventy weeks are decreed about your people and your holy city to finish the transgression to put an end to sin and to atone for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal both vision and prophet, and to anoint a most holy place. Know therefore and understand that from the going out of the word to restore and build Jerusalem to the coming of an anointed one, a prince, there will be seven weeks Then for 62 weeks it shall be built again with squares and moat, but in a troubled time. And after the 62 weeks, an anointed one shall be cut off and shall have nothing. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and its sanctuary. Its end shall come with a flood. And to the end there shall be war, desolations are decreed. And he shall make a strong covenant with many for one week. And for half of the week, he shall put an end to sacrifice and offering. 
and of the wing of abominations shall come one who makes desolate until the decreed end is poured out on the desolator. Interesting passage of scripture, isn't it? Look back at verse 24. 70 weeks are decreed for your people, Daniel, to do the things that he mentions there. One of them to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal both vision and prophet, and to anoint a most holy place. Interesting. 70 weeks. Daniel, you've got 70 weeks, and all those things are going to be fulfilled. Whoa. Now, this passage of scripture, you got to go in and do some math. I'm not going to have the time to go in and do all the math, but I'm going to share with you a few things. First of all, 70 weeks. 70 weeks are decreed from the restoration of Jerusalem to the establishment of everlasting righteousness. 70 weeks are decreed from the restoration of Jerusalem. Okay, so Daniel is in Babylon right now, and he is waiting for Jerusalem to be restored. He wants Jerusalem to get back to its former glory. And Gabriel the angel comes to Daniel and says, Daniel, you've got 70 weeks from the restoration of Jerusalem to the establishment of everlasting righteousness. Daniel, you've got 70 weeks. Possibly a better translation of the Hebrew. And some of your Bibles even say this. Possibly a better translation of the Hebrew would say 77s. 70 groups of seven, which is really the closest to the Hebrew. So 70 groups of seven. That's really the closest to the Hebrew. 70 times seven. 70 groups, if you look at the math in this passage, and the events that Gabriel describes and the 70 groups of seven, this has to refer to 70 groups of seven years or 490 years. 490 years, 70 groups of seven, 490 years. Gabriel was telling Daniel that from the time of the restoration of Jerusalem, because Jerusalem was currently in ruins, To the time of the commencement of everlasting righteousness, it would be 490 years. But did Gabriel say consecutive 490 years? He did not. He just said it's a span of 490 years. It starts from the decree to restore Jerusalem to the time of everlasting righteousness. It is 490 years, but not necessarily consecutive Years, as we're about to see. Look at verse 25. Look at verse 25. Know therefore and understand that from the going out of the word to restore and build Jerusalem, that's an important element there. Know therefore and understand that from the going out of the word to restore and build Jerusalem. The going out of the word to restore and build Jerusalem. This was likely the edict that was given in Nehemiah 2 1 to rebuild Jerusalem. The edict that was given to rebuild Jerusalem. This date is one of the best known dates in ancient history, even attested to in the Encyclopedia Britannica. It's the first day of the Hebrew month of Nisan, 445 BC. In our calendar, March 14th, 445 BC. From the decree to rebuild Jerusalem to the time of everlasting righteousness. From March 14th, 445 to the time of everlasting righteousness. So from the time the decree to rebuild the city, there's a period of 69 combined weeks. There's a lot of information here that we don't have a time to get into, but just look at verse, at the latter part of verse 25 again. Then for 62 weeks, it shall be built again with squares and moats, but in a troubled time, but in 62 weeks. So there's a combined 69 weeks for what Gabriel is saying here, from the various things that are mentioned as happening in these 69 weeks, like the anointed one coming, which is, there's two anointed ones that are mentioned in this passage. One is likely Jerusalem, I'm sorry, Joshua, relating to the rebuilding of uh, the temple in Jerusalem. And there's a reference to another anointed one that is coming. Likely, this is a reference to the Messiah, Jesus. What does Gabriel say? He says that the anointed one will be cut off and shall have nothing. After the 62 weeks, an anointed one shall be cut off and shall have nothing, and the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and its sanctuary. So the anointed one dies, 
after the 69th week. Gabriel mentions that after the anointed one comes, another prince comes. Verse 26, and after the 62 weeks, an anointed one shall be cut off and shall have nothing, and the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and its sanctuary. Okay, this is likely a reference to the destruction of Jerusalem uh, in 70 AD, but Daniel makes it clear that another prince is coming. What does this do? Look at verse 27. He shall make a strong covenant with many for one week. And for half of the week, he shall put an end to sacrifice and to offering. He shall put an end to sacrifice and to offering. So the prince makes a covenant for one week or seven years. Halfway through that seven years, the prince ends sacrifice and offering. And as the text says here, look at the end of verse 27. And on the wing of abomination shall come one who makes desolate until the decreed end is poured out on the desolator. The prince that is coming, verse 27, makes a strong covenant with many for one week, and for half of the week he puts an end to sacrifice and offering, and on the wing of abomination shall come one who makes desolate until the decreed end is poured out on the desolator. After the 69th week, the Messiah dies. Some 40 years later, Jerusalem is destroyed. And at the start of the 70th week, the prince who is to come will make a covenant for one week or seven years. He will stop sacrifices and offerings halfway through the seven-year period or three and a half years into the seven years. Gabriel says he commits some form of abomination. So in other words, he presents to the many, peace. Peace that he guarantees. Halfway through this seven-year period, he commits some form of abomination that makes it clear he's not really on a peace path. This is the final week of Daniel's prophecy. 69 weeks plus one Daniel's 70 weeks. There's no indication from history that this 70th week has happened yet. Jesus spoke about the 70th week of Daniel. In Matthew 24, 50 to 18, Jesus said this. So when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel standing in the holy place, let the reader understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let the one who is in the housetop not go down to take what is in his house. Let the one who is in the field not turn back to get his cloak. Jesus says when this abomination of desolation takes place where you see this man standing in the holy place committing some form of abomination, get out. The end is near. The end is near. This is the 70th week of Daniel. Paul spoke about the 70th week of Daniel in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. Paul said this, let no one deceive you in any way. That day will not come, the day of the Lord, unless the rebellion comes first, some form of rebellion that's evidenced in the world against God, unless the rebellion comes first, and the man of lawlessness is revealed. This man that Daniel spoke about in Daniel chapter 9 Um, the prince who is to come, the son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God and object of worship. Paul, what does this man do? He takes his seat in the temple of God and proclaims himself to be God. Paul gets even more specific. Jesus says when the abomination of desolation happens, when that prince who is to come in Daniel's 70th week, halfway through commits some form of abomination, Jesus said when that happens, get out. Paul goes into even greater detail and says that man of sin, the Antichrist, when he comes, he'll take his place in the temple. He'll physically go into the temple, he'll sit down, and he'll say, I'm God. Worship me says right there in the text, proclaiming himself to be God. 
The scripture's so clear. So the Bible depicts that 69 weeks of Daniel are in the past. The 70th week of Daniel, the final seven years, is still to come. Based on the books of Matthew, 2 Thessalonians, the book of Revelation, it becomes clear that the seven years, 70th week of Daniel, is the tribulation period described in the book of Revelation. Following the seven-year tribulation period, Revelation 19 details the return of Christ following the tribulation period, which is when the battle of Armageddon takes place or the series of battles of Armageddon, Revelation 16. This is followed by the sheep and goat judgment from Matthew 25. We need many more weeks to go into the details of all these things, but you can read that in Matthew 25. And then the millennial reign of Christ from Revelation chapter 20. Um, This is one way that you could potentially uh, visualize the things that I was just discussing. So you have Daniel's uh, 69 weeks happening from the decree to rebuild Jerusalem to the cutting off of the Messiah, 69 weeks. Then you have a church age. So in other words, Gabriel never says these had to be consecutive 70 weeks. We're obviously living right now in a parenthesis because the Antichrist has not come. The man of lawlessness has not come. He has not set up a temple in Jerusalem to be an object of worship. These things have not happened, which would tell us the 70th week is still to come. And that we're living in a parenthesis period between the 69th and 70th weeks. Following the age of the church, the rapture happens, which is when... Approximately after the rapture, we don't exactly know when it exactly starts, the 70th week of Daniel begins. That's the tribulation period. The Bible tells us it lasts seven years. At the end of this seven-year tribulation period, it's Daniel's 70th week, Christ's second coming occurs, and then he ushers in his kingdom, which lasts 1,000 literal years. Following the reign of Christ for 1,000 literal years is the great white throne judgment for unbelievers, and then we have the new heaven and the new earth, all right? So you have the Old Testament lasting 69 weeks. That is Daniel's 69 weeks. We have the age of the church. This is where you are right now. This has lasted at least 2,000 years. Um, The rapture of the church is the next thing we're looking for, which is followed by Daniel's 70th week. Halfway through that 70th week, the man of sin, the Antichrist, commits the abomination of desolation where he puts himself into the temple in Jerusalem, sits on the throne in Jerusalem, and says, I'm God, worship me. That's when things become worse. At the end of the seven-year tribulation period is Christ's second coming, followed by the kingdom, which lasts 1,000 years. Uh, There's more details to throw into here. Uh, One final rebellion after Satan is released. There's just a lot of information here that I didn't want to clutter up the timeline too much. But then you have the great white throne judgment, the new heaven and the new earth, and then eternity. Flip back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. First Thessalonians 5. Paul says this in verse 1. Now concerning the times and the season, brothers, you have no need for anything to be written to you. You yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying there's peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. They will not escape. Paul is saying, hey, Thessalonians, we've talked about this. We've talked about the day of the Lord. We've talked about the timing of some of these things. Don't be rattled by the events that you're seeing around you. This day of the Lord will start with peace and safety. It'll start with something coming on to the world scene. You see this in Revelation chapter six, saying, I can bring peace. I can bring a peace path. We don't have to live in in total destruction as Middle Eastern neighbors. I can bring peace. He brings peace and safety. It becomes very clear to the world that, wow, for the first time in thousands of years, things are actually looking pretty good. Things are actually on on a path to peace. That's what Paul says here. While people are saying peace and security, then sudden destruction comes. It just comes out of nowhere. They don't see it coming, and it just hits them. That the events that we thought were going to bring peace, this isn't peace. This is like hell on earth. Paul was teaching eschatology here. 
in verses 1 and 2. He was teaching eschatology. He was teaching these Thessalonians that knowing about the end times is important. But Paul also told them that the day of the Lord would be unexpected. It would be unexpected. The world would be living during a piece of unprecedented peace when the events leading to the day of the Lord begin to transpire. Daniel 9, 26 says, the peace who is to come, the Antichrist, the man of lawlessness, brokers a peace deal at the start of the 70th week. The world believes all is good. Paul told these Thessalonians that the day would not overtake them in verses four to eight. The day of the Lord is a day of darkness, but Paul here says they are not of the darkness, but light. Those of the day are to be alert and not in moral laziness like those who are in the dark. Paul told them their destiny was not wrath. 1 Thessalonians 5, 9 through 11. Their destiny was not wrath. Look at verse 9, 1 Thessalonians 5, 9. For God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. The day of the Lord was clearly depicted as a period of wrath. Paul said these believers were not appointed to wrath. Paul also said the same thing in 1 Thessalonians 1.9, that Jesus delivers us from the wrath to come and that this should be a credible source of comfort for these believers. Last week we talked about the different isms and how people can have different perspectives. I want to share with you my perspective and what I believe about the timing of the end times, specifically uh, the rapture of the church. I believe the Bible teaches that the church will not go through Daniel's 70th week. I don't believe the Bible teaches that. Why is that? Because the church is a called out people, unique from the nation of Israel. I don't believe that the church and Israel have blended into one group. I don't believe that the scripture teaches that. The Bible says that the day of the Lord is the day of Jacob's trouble, very clearly. Revelation 3.10 says the Lord will keep the church from the hour of persecution that is coming on the whole earth. That verse is so plain and so clear and if you read it in its context, it's so plain and it's so clear that the Lord will keep the church from the hour of persecution that's coming on the whole earth. And in Thessalonians, Paul depicts the day of the Lord as wrath, yet clearly states that believers are not destined to wrath some application. The disciples asked Jesus in Acts 1, listen closely, the disciples asked Jesus, when are these things going to happen? Are you now going to set up your kingdom? You know what Jesus' response to that was? It is not for you to know. It is not for you to know. I mean, <laughs> these, are, these are the guys in Jesus' inner circle if there's anyone had the right to say to Jesus, hey, Jesus, just kind of give us a little information here. Can he, can he give us like a month? Can he give us a general time period? Jesus said, no. You don't need to know, and I don't want you to know. Because if I tell you when I'm coming back, you know what you're going to naturally do? I'm not saying Jesus said any of this. This is just human nature. You, you know what we're naturally going to do? We're going to live our lives the way that we want until that very moment before Christ comes back, and then suddenly we'll have a personal revival. I hope I wouldn't do it, but I couldn't tell you for certain. This is why Jesus in Matthew 24 and 25, which is all about the end times, Jesus is saying, be ready, be ready, be ready. Be prepared. I'm coming back. I'm not telling you when I'm coming back, but you must be prepared. Jesus says, no one knows that I'm going to return. You can't know. Jesus said you can't know. And so to set dates or to do otherwise would be to disregard Scripture. You can see the signs, but you can't know the day or the hour. This is why Jesus emphasized preparedness. If anyone tells you the date that Jesus is coming back, don't believe them. Jesus even said that in the end times, many people are going to say, oh, this Christ is coming back, and this person's coming back, and, and go look at this person. Jesus said all these things are going to happen. Stick to the Scripture. Study the Scriptures. Listen to the words of Christ. We don't know when Christ is coming back. We need to be prepared. Are you prepared? Are you prepared? Do you know beyond any shadow of a doubt that if Christ were to come back today you'd go to glory to be with him do you know that 
And if you do know that, is your life ready? Your marriage, is it in a good place? Your relationship with your kids, is it where you want it to be? Jesus said, be prepared, be ready. I'm coming, be ready. I would not be one to talk about the signs of the times and whatever I believe it's coming soon. I mean, after World War I, everyone thought Jesus was coming back, right? <laughs> after World War II, everyone thought Jesus was coming back, right? After the European Union, everyone thought Jesus was coming back. This has been going on for a long time now. This is why Jesus said, don't do that. Just be ready now. As if I were coming back tonight. Is there someone you need to tell about Christ? Is there a coworker you need to tell about Christ? You're not guaranteed tomorrow. Even in your life, you're not guaranteed tomorrow. The time is now.